Hi, everybody. My name is Peter. I'm glad you can make it at 9 a.m. Uh, I'm going to be talking about high-performance JavaScript in V8. Um, so a little bit about myself. I work on the V8 team in Munich. Um, and I've been there about a year now. I moved there from Australia to work on V8. Um, and yeah, I really enjoy it. I've been working on mostly uh, some new language features, like um, spread and stuff like that. And I'm also focusing on Node.js performance um, in V8. So basically, the idea of this talk is um, that it's going to be about what does fast modern JavaScript look like? That's hopefully the question I'm going to be answering by the end of the talk. Um, so, but first of all, what is an engine anyway? So V8 is the JavaScript runtime or compiler or engine uh, within Node.js and within Chrome as well. So these are the two biggest embedders of V8. Um, and anytime you're running some JavaScript in Node or in Chrome, it's running through V8. So the talk is going to be focused around this idea of language dialects, which is kind of interesting when it comes to performance. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of V8, and I'm going to give some code examples. We're going to look at a few benchmarks and stuff like that, and um, yeah, just have a look at the performance and how that's changed over the last few years. So why do we care about performance? You might say, well, I have a really beastie computer. It has all this RAM, and I've got you know, solid state drives, and you know, performance is like a solved issue. We'll just throw hardware at it, right? Um, well, it's true, but hardware costs money, and uh, if you are serving to hundreds of millions of people, then your servers probably cost a lot of money, so even small improvements are um, translating into a lot of money for your business. Um, users also like speed, so um, you can show that users who are getting faster response times from their pages um, are more engaged and more likely to stay on your site. But as well as these like 2 3% improvements, and yeah, that's all good, efficiency, um, Performance is also a factor in these sort of transformative use cases of the language. So like 15 years ago, no one was seriously running JavaScript on the server side, and now Node.js is one of the biggest languages doing that. And um, if you look at the reason why, it's part of it comes down to performance. Um, so people often ask, like, why isn't JavaScript performance a solved problem? Because you know, v 8 has been around for nine years, and the other JavaScript engines longer than that. So like, why haven't you finished making it fast yet? It's basically what people ask me. Like, why do you have a job? <laughs> so why I still have a job? OK, the language is growing. So we have to add new things to the language. This is like through the TC39 process. We add features. Um, and yeah, so we actually need to just add these things, right? Um, but this is probably not as much of the work we do as you would think. It's something like 15 20% maybe. It's just like adding the new features so that we're spec compliant. Um, the other really big thing is that JavaScript's a really high-level language. And basically, the job of V8 and other compilers is to take that really high-level language that we write and know and love and turn it into this like, low-level assembly language that your CPU actually understands. Um, and there's all these trade-offs in there where you know, it's not immediately obvious which sort of trade-off you need to make, and maybe that changes over time. So that's also difficult. Um, the other thing is performance is definitely not solved on low-end machines. So on mobile phones, you can still look at like 20, 30 seconds for loading a website, and particularly on like low-end mobile phones, $50 smartphones, that kind of thing, um, performance is still really, really important. But the biggest thing is that people change the way that they use JavaScript. This is probably um, the most work we're doing at the moment. So Everyone knows in the JavaScript community, you know, there's all these new packages every year and new frameworks and everything like that, and people are changing the way they're using JavaScript. But they're not just uh, doing the same thing in a different way. They're actually changing what they're doing. So the way the language is being used is changing. And there are so many ways to do the exact same thing in JavaScript and in most languages. You know, you can use a, uh, a for loop with, you know, a, a var i and just iterate that, or you could do a for in or something, or you could just have, like, 100 if statements or whatever you want to do. There's so many ways to do the exact same thing. So this leads to um, idioms and styles of the language. So what are the most commonly used features? How are they used? How are they used together? Um, and these idioms and styles form dialects of the language, much like in spoken language. So you see common use, pa uh, common use patterns um, in JavaScript. And this is really interesting for performance, because um, we have this huge world of JavaScript, and we have to sort of pick, OK, what do people really want to be fast? Um, so I want to talk about this thing called crankshaft script. And crankshaft script is a dialect of JavaScript. 
and its only purpose is to run as fast as possible in the V8 crankshaft compiler. Okay, so I told you that um, I was gonna talk about how to run fast code in V8, and I just told you crankshaft script is really, really fast, so now you're like, okay, talk over. We can run fast code now, okay. But we actually deleted crankshaft script recently, so you can't do that anymore. <laughs> the talk is not over. Um, yeah, I love this CL, plus two. <laughs> Why? Um, so Crankshaft was the optimizing compiler in V8, so this is the part that was responsible for generating fast code, right? Um, what is an optimizing compiler? Well, it looks something like this. Uh, this is how the old pipeline worked in V8. Um, there's some boxes missing from this diagram, but the basic idea is you have a baseline compiler, and this was called full code gen, and the job here was it would run every piece of code, so it would be able to run any JavaScript that it's valid. Um, and while it did this, it would generate some baseline code, so it would generate assembly code that then gets run on the hardware. Um, but it also did another job, which is collect feedback on the types that we see. Um, so a major thing for running fast JavaScript is that it's not statically typed, and so we don't know how to actually access these properties, or we don't know what we need to do with the object because we don't know what type it is. So the baseline compiler collects feedback and runs the code. So it goes, okay, I've seen all these types. You've used a string the first 100 times you've called this function. Um, once we have enough feedback and there's some heuristics in there, then we send it to the optimizing compiler. And this is what Crankshaft was. And Crankshaft would uh, take this code and it would take the feedback and it would generate super optimized code um, for uh, these assumptions that we have that say this type is always gonna be a string, that kind of thing. And we produce optimized code. So we've actually changed this now and we sort of replaced the pipeline a bit. We have a new optimizing compiler called Turbofan um, that does basically the same thing but in a really different way. Um, and we instead have a baseline interpreter instead of a baseline compiler, so um, this doesn't generate machine code, but it just runs it in place, and it still collects the feedback, and we still optimize and everything like that. Um, so what were some of the problems with Crankshaft? Like, why did we delete this giant thing instead of just working on it a little bit and trying to make it faster? Um, so Crankshaft was starting to show its age. Um, it didn't support the whole language, so there were a lot of things like try catch, and we'll go into that later, um, that weren't actually natively supported in Crankshaft, which just meant you could never optimize a function if it contained a try catch or something like that. Um, also, newer language features um, couldn't be supported in optimized code as well, so we could run them in V8, but never in an optimized function. Um, and Crankshaft was really bad at learning from deoptimization. So deoptimization is where we make an assumption, yeah, we're gonna have these types, uh, and then later we find out that that's wrong, um, and we have to go back to our baseline level of code. Um, but Crankshaft would just sort of get in these loops where it sort of didn't really figure out how to actually make fast code out of this. Um, as well, it had this really weird performance profile, so it would have these performance cliffs where you're going along doing something pretty reasonable and you change one thing really slightly, um, and then it's like 10 times slower suddenly, and we'll see some examples of that. Um, and it made it really hard to work with. Also, there were some sort of structural issues. Um, you couldn't, there was no real clear uh, separation in the phases of compilation. Um, we had to write a lot of handwritten assembly code because we supported nine different architectures. Um, and uh, full code gen, the baseline compiler also produced a lot of code, which cost a lot of memory, particularly on mobile. So there were lots of reasons to replace this. Um, and here's just one example. So the details of this aren't really important. What's important is to know that this sort of thing happened all the time in Crankshaft. So we get bugs logged that look like const let declaration after a loop slows down the loop by several times. And you just think like, why would that possibly happen? So basically you have a loop um, and then you declare a variable after it somewhere in the same function. Um, and if you declared this thing as a var, everything would be fine. And then maybe one day you come along and clean up your code and you're like, actually this is a const and you change it to a const, now it's gonna be 10 times slower in Crankshaft. And it's not important that just this thing happened, the important thing to take away here is that this kind of thing happened all the time in Crankshaft. You would change something very slightly and suddenly you'd fall off this performance cliff and um, you'd be totally unsupported. And you get these, like, if you really dig into it and you've spent some time doing some V8 performance profiling, then you'll probably see error messages like this, unsupported phi use of const or let variable which doesn't really make any sense to you as a developer and um, isn't particularly helpful anyway, but basically Crankshaft couldn't support these features. Um, so part of the goal with Turbofan was, okay, we wanna provide predictable baseline performance, right? So we want to have a compiler which um, can support all the language features, has wider fast paths, isn't so unpredictable, basically. 
Um, so we want to have wide, fast paths where we can support all the language features, and we want to sort of degrade gracefully when we're not on the fast path anymore. We want to eliminate these performance cliffs so it's much more predictable. I like to have these cuteness breaks. <laughs> You're so cute. Um, so there was some crankshaft performance advice floating around out there, and part of this was V8 team would um, give out this information, and then people who are interested would also hack on it for a while and then come up with this list of things, yeah, this is fast, this isn't. And you can generally tell crankshaft performance advice because it starts with the word don't. And basically, it follows the form of don't use these particular language features because they're slow. Um, and this is sort of a bad place to be at in your language. So it would follow uh, the pattern of don't use let const, don't use try catch or try finally, don't use for in, don't use generators or async functions. Um, and this is kind of really sad for JavaScript developers because they're like, yeah, there's all this cool stuff in the language. Don't use it. Um, and this is what leads to things like crankshaft scripts. So this dialect where we're avoiding certain things, um, you're writing it in a weird way, and you're sort of forced to choose between code that is idiomatic and nice and easy to read and maintainable and code that is actually performant. Um, and it was kind of this strange process too. So it, it shouldn't go that um, uh, certain language features are banned or not able to be used or something like that, then why have them in the language, right? Um, so it makes more sense to observe how the community uses the tools um, like V8 and then figure out, okay, this is an idiomatic use case which makes sense, let's try and make that fast, right? So we're gonna go through some examples of crankshaft script. Um, and if you're ever looking for crankshaft script, you can just grep a code base, find a really long comment with the word V8 in it, and you'll find like a really long apology being like, sorry. <laughs> I had to do this, it was faster. Um, so here's an example from NodeCore, and it says, this implementation of check is HTTP token loops over the string instead of using a regular expression, since the former is up to 180% faster with V8 4.9. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Um, and then you see the code on the left, and basically what this does um, is there's this valid tokens array at the top, and it takes a string um, and filters each character to check whether uh, the characters in the string are allowed, basically. Um, according to some set of rules. And this is stored in valid tokens, so you take, a, uh, you take each character out of the string, and then you convert it to its char code, and then you use that char code as an index for the valid tokens array, and you look up, you get a zero or a one, and then that's your Boolean result. Um, it's kind of long here, you see they've manually peeled the first three iterations of the loop off, because this happened to be faster. Um, but it's kind of difficult to tell what it does, apart from just reading the function name. Um, and you see on the right, this is uh, the equivalent code that it replaced. And the problem was that this was much faster to do it this way in Crankshaft. Um, and on the right, we have, okay, we have a regex literal, um, and then we just go check his HTTP token, and you use the string um, test there, right? And what this does is it introduces this brittle binding between uh, the code and the engine. And not only, okay, the specific engine of V8, but the specific version of V8, right? So this is faster in V8 4.9. Okay, but is it faster in 5.0 or the current version 6.2, 6.3? Um, you don't know, you have to keep running this benchmark or coming back to it. Um, and uh, as well as that, you've got this code which is far less readable, right? Um, and it's easily outdated, so you might have to change this every time you update the V8 version. Um, it's much harder to read and maintain, but most of all, it shows us that we aren't really supporting real-world use cases. Um, so. Another example is that, remember before I said you can't use try catch or try finally. So people would go, okay, yeah, but I really need to use try catch or try finally, right? Um, but V8 optimizes on a per function basis. So what you would do instead is the thing that might throw, you put that in its own function bar, and then you create a new function, which would just, just have the try catch wrapper, right? And if bar is longer and has lots of code, then okay, we can still optimize bar. Um, and then this is still fast, and then we just have this slower try catch bit, which is not optimizable. Um, and then if you do this in a hot loop, then maybe it's worth it, right? So you can still sort of use try catch, you just have to split your code apart in a really weird way. Um, and in V8 5.1, if you split the code like this into two functions, this was 1.27x faster, right? So this kind of makes sense, and you would see this in some applications, they would sort of do this everywhere. Um, and this sort of became idiomatic JavaScript. This became crankshaft script, right? Um, in V8 6.0, this makes literally no difference whether you split them apart or not. Um, so it's not really worth doing anymore, yet we have all this code which looks like this, um, but doesn't even do uh, what it was meant to do. Um, 
The other takeaway here is that this 19x is how much faster this is overall in 6.0 versus 5.1. So the real takeaway is just use the latest version, right? Because it's going to be much faster automatically. Um, there's another example from the Ember code base, and um, this is another really long comment. This exists because object.create null is absurdly slow compared to new empty object. In either case, you want a null prototype when you're treating the object instances as arbitrary dictionaries, and you don't want keys colliding with built-in methods on the default object prototype. So this is basically about um, just creating an, an object with a null prototype that's empty, right? Um, and so they have this special empty object uh, that exists in Ember um, that creates an object with a null prototype to avoid using object.create null, which would sort of be the idiomatic JavaScript way of doing this. And maybe this makes sense for your code base to have this special empty object thing, or maybe it doesn't, and it's a bit harder to read. That's up to you. But in Crankshaft, uh, you would sort of have to do it this way, because it was about 10 times faster if you do this in a hot loop and create all these empty objects, right? Um, in V8 6.0, again, this makes literally no difference. But at least now you have the choice between do I want this wrapping to give a, our own semantic flavor to it, or do we want to use the object to create null, which might be easy to read on first glance. <laughs> okay. okay, so I told you that um, this talk was going to be about fast JavaScript, and you're like, okay, that's what not to do. That's what used to work. Okay, now tell me the TurboFan script, right? That's what you all came here to see. Uh, okay, well, I'm not really going to do that. So it doesn't really exist. We don't want to know what that looks like. So it should look like regular readable JavaScript. That's the goal, right? You shouldn't have to hack around and make special exceptions and put comments in your code being like, I'm sorry. Um, it should, you should just be able to write regular JavaScript and it should be able to run fast. It should be able to use ES6 features. It should work well on any engine, right? So there's a subset of JavaScript which is more easily optimizable and sort of does reasonable, sensible things, and this should run fast everywhere. You shouldn't have to specialize to a particular engine or a particular version of an engine, a particular compiler, that kind of thing. Um, so Ignition and TurboFan are stable in Chrome at the moment, so if you're using Chrome, then you're already using this new compiler pipeline. Um, and it's also released in Node and will be in the Node 8 LTS, um, and most of the 8 versions come with this as well. So um, if you haven't tried it out yet, I encourage you to. Um, so as well as that, there's some more examples of what was difficult to do with Crankshaft, and this really shows the trade-off you had to make. Um, so if you want to do something with the arguments object where you're actually returning the argument, so you force V8 to materialize this arguments object um, and return it in some way. In Crankshaft, this would just not optimize at all. And if you dug into it and spent a few hours digging through, you'd eventually get um, bad value context for arguments value. And this is probably a pretty common one if you've done like a lot of performance optimization and you were looking through things in Node Core, your own applications, you might see a message like this. And it's kind of really annoying. So you're taking the arguments, and if there's one argument, you just want to return that. If there's more, then you want to return that in a regular array. That's basically what this slice thing does. Um, so here the code looks all right. This is like not too bad. It seems fairly idiomatic. Um, it's pretty clear what it's doing. Um, but this is never optimized by Crankshaft. OK. So what did people do instead? Well, they looked. Um, they, you create your own array, and then you copy the elements into it one by one. So this is like, you can still sort of see what's going on, but you have to add all this extra code, and um, you have this overhead of creating a new array and copying everything in one by one. Um, so it's a bit longer. So the upshot is that this is optimizable by Crankshaft, right? But the code is like, uh, not really what you wanted to write in the first place. So you had to make this choice between, OK, do I want it to be fast, or do I want it to be readable? Um, in TurboFan, it looks like this, right? So you can just use rest parameters, um, and you have the x, and then that will take the first parameter, and args will take the rest of them, and you can just do this. And this is totally optimizable by TurboFan. This is way faster than either of the previous two options. Um, and the code is like really nice to read and totally idiomatic JavaScript. And this is what TurboFan is really good at. Um, so what about microbenchmarks? How did we get to this state where we had crankshaft script? Um, well, microbenchmarks are really great at measuring one thing. Uh, it's just really hard to figure out what that one thing is. And they stress optimizing compilers in sort of the completely wrong way. So they're really good at doing the same thing over and over again. This is what microbenchmarks um, 
try and do. They pick one thing and they do it over and over again in a tight loop and you measure how fast that is. It turns out Crankshaft was really great at doing that, but nobody writes applications which does that because that doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you do the same calculation over and over again? Um, so benchmarks um, are an important part of the performance story, but they, micro benchmarks don't always tell you everything you need to know. So what they really give you is this peak performance number, which says like, if I hack and hack and hack, how fast can I get this one thing exactly to run? Um, but they don't give you an indication of predictability or resilience, right? So if something changes slightly in your application, someone changes a var to a const, you don't want your whole performance story to go out the window, right? You, you want it to be a bit resilient to code change and refactoring and all these kind of things. You also want it to be able to accept, you know, user types that you weren't expecting um, and not totally have awful performance, right? So the upshot here is we need to get some real world benchmarks and this is what we're focusing on with TurboFan. So I guess the takeaways overall are please stop writing crankshaft script. Uh, it doesn't work anymore <laughs> and um, you don't need to either. Um, aim for the average case, not the peak performance case, right? So when you're thinking about performance, don't just think about how fast can I get this thing to exactly run, but um, you know, what's the overall performance story? Um, and we want you use cases as well. So um, we can only base this performance work on what the community gives us and what they think is important and fast. Uh, so if you have any issues that you run into, you can log an issue on the V8 issue tracker and we can look into it and you can be like, yeah, this was kind of faster with the old version and now it's not anymore and we can look into it. That's really interesting. So thanks very much. You can reach me at petermarshall at google.com. Uh, you can see me on GitHub as PS Marshall. You can log a bug on our issue tracker. Uh, you can also add us on Twitter. We have a Twitter account now. It's V8JS. When you're adding us on Twitter, make sure you get V8JS and not V8 because that is vegetable juice. <laughs> we actually have more followers than the vegetable juice. <laughs> Okay, that's all. Thank you very much for listening.